Hey everybody, my name is Roy Conover and I'm the care pastor here at Life Point Church and we are so glad that you have tuned in and are joining us today. Now, if you're kicking back on your couch with your coffee in hand, good for you. We're glad that you are with us. Just want to let you know, if you are brand new, there are different ways that you can get connected here at LifePoint. One of the easiest ways is to look up our Church Center app. Just click on that button and it's going to help you get connected and take all of your next steps, whether that is getting part of a group or coming here on Tuesday nights for our STEP program, which is all about support groups, or whether it's joining a women's group, a men's group, we've got kids programming. There is so much here to help you and your family get connected. And we also know that we need the support of our church to be able to do what it is we do. And so we've tried to make giving as easy as possible. If you just click that Give button on the Church Center app, it'll take you to our Secure Rebel Give site. And when you do that, however God moves on your heart to give, whatever amount, it really doesn't matter. That's between you and God. We just encourage you to be able to support what we're doing here at LifePoint. And so our hope is that we're going to be able to connect with you and your family and just so glad that you have joined us. We pray that you have a blessed day. If you look at the book of Psalms, you can see that there are lots of different ways to pray. The Psalms are one of the most beloved books of all time. It showcases people desperate to hear from their God. Kings that are so grateful that God has intervened in their life. Cities that have been demolished and demoralized that cry out for their God to return to them. Prayer really is the currency of humanity. And your prayer reveals you as well. It reveals so much about your relationship with God or a relationship that you want to get better. And our hope for you in this series is to realize that your prayers go to God. And the fact is, He hears us. Good morning. If we haven't met before, my name is Kyle. You may remember me from 10 seconds ago on this video. And uh, I, I have to admit, I don't really like watching myself on camera. I don't like listening to myself. I always go, is that what I look like? Like, is that what I sound like? It's, it's, so, but I made a promise to several people on staff that I would not complain about myself. So I will let you guys do that. And you can tell me about it later on. But the reason we showed that bumper video is that um, during the fall, we do a very big series. We do a couple big church series a year. Uh, and this is one of them. We've never done a series like this, and part of the reason we're doing it is that our spiritual formation pastor, uh, Fred, I'm going to give him full credit, he said, all major church revivals begin with prayer. And, and I said in the video is that prayers really are the currency of humanity. If you go anywhere on the planet, no matter whether you're an atheist, agnostic, a Buddhist, a Christian, a Muslim, or anywhere else, there is some form of prayer. And prayer is all throughout the Bible. It is unique, um, and especially in Christianity, has a unique way of how it's done, when it's done, why it's done, and for whom it's done. And this, this series, we felt, was too, too big not to do. And so sometimes we do a theological series, and sometimes we do a series on parenting. But this one encompasses all areas of life. And almost everyone can say yes to needing prayer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal story throughout this series. Uh, Money, even though I was an atheist for a very long time, and even I prayed to a God I didn't believe in, which sounds oxymoronic, but there you are. And part of the reason we kind of showed that video is that during this season, we ask everyone in the church to join a group. Because what happens on Sunday is not enough. What happens here, I'm not an engaging enough teacher. I'm not funny, you guys all know that. Um, I pretty appreciate the pity laughs at times, but I'm just not that good. But what is good is being in a community of people in a group that people have, who will pray with you and for you and who will care for you, and there is no substitute for being in community. And so what we hope to do is to give you an extra resource. So we filmed a bunch of videos that we hope will engage you in your prayer life because it's going to be a different kind of series. And we'll still talk theology, and we'll still talk families, and we'll still talk about the church, and we'll still talk about your lives, and we'll still talk about next steps. But more so than anything else, we want you to have a robust prayer life with God. Because there is no substitute for that. There is no church program. There is no community. There is no book. There is nothing like praying to a God who can accomplish far more than you and I can. 
So what I want to do today is I want to intro this series, and I want to talk about something that's kind of dangerous. Uh, the title of this message is called God's Promise in Your Prayers. Now, anytime someone uses the word God's promise, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful, meaning you have to get this part right, because there are a lot of books out there. There are a lot of pastors there are a lot of theologians. There are a lot of people who have a lot of social media followers. And the reason they get big is because they can guarantee that God says something and he'll deliver on that promise. And many of them, just to be honest, are phony. It's very dangerous when you say God promises something. You have to be sure that he does. And I think I'm sure, and I'm hoping not to join the ranks of people who just over-promise and under-deliver. And so I'm hoping to be clear about this today, and I'm hoping to be helpful, because I do think God promises something in your prayer life, and I do think it's really, really helpful. So today is called God's Promise in Your Prayer, and I want to do a couple different things. I want to just ask some questions, because I think questions are very, very revealing. They help us understand. So I want to ask a series of questions real quick. So four big questions about prayer. They're super basic, but if you can't answer any of these questions, prayer may not be super useful for you. So the first one is this, why do you pray? Why? I mean, if you don't know the why, then you have no reason to pray. For some people, it's because they're looking for healing for a loved one. For some people, they're looking for direction. For some people, it is that they just want to know that there is a God or someone or something out there that hears them. For some people, it's just an exercise. They've been taught that, and that when they grew up, it was a part of their motion, and maybe they've lost the meaning, and they're just normal. Maybe the part of the reason is you don't want to get food poisoning before your meal, and so you figured, ah, I'll pray, you know, what could it hurt? You know, I don't want these tacos to come back up later on, so let's do that. I know it's gross, so, but you're going to pray before the next meal, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, just in case. So why do you pray? So the next one would be, who do you pray for, to pray to? This one's a little bit surprising, too, because not everyone in the world prays to the same being or beings. There are lots of religions in the world. Christianity is just one of them. And there are people who pray to an unknown God. The Apostle Paul talks about that in the New Testament, one of his letters. There are people who pray to many gods. There are people who pray to just something or someone out there. There are people who pray to crystals. There are people who pray to ancient family members. So the who is not always the same no matter where you go in the planet. So who you pray to might matter more than anything else. Because if whoever or whatever you're praying to has the ability, the power, and the know-how to grant your prayer. For most people, they just want to know whoever that is, and that's the being or the thing that they want to pray to. So the who matters a lot. How should you pray? This is another one. How should you pray? I mean, this one gets all sorts of um, <clears throat> different opinions. I'll tell you a little bit. In my house, sometimes we'll be praying, and yes, it is over tacos, because we eat a lot of tacos in my house. And every once in a while, we'll be praying, and you'll hear this crunch mid-prayer, <coughs> and you're like, we know someone's not praying right now because they're hungry. And so, like, I'll, I'll sometimes, again, maybe it's a job hazard because I work at a church, or maybe just because I'm a Christian, but I'll be like, hey, put down the taco. Like, put down the taco. Close your eyes. Hold our hands. And it's not like God's up there and be like, okay, prayer's going well. Up, oh, they open their eyes. Yep, this one doesn't count. Doesn't count now. And if you were to holding hands, I might have said yes. But because you didn't do that, I mean, I can't even hear them when they're not closing their eyes. Like, it's ridiculous, right? You can pray walking, you can pray closing your eyes, you can pray in public. There are lots of different ways to pray. And maybe some are better than others. And then there's what should you pray for. And this is probably the one that most of us center on. We want to get to the asking phase. We want to get to the what of our desires or our needs or the things that we need help on. We go, hey, God, would you help me with this thing? Now, for those of you who like questions, you're like, you know, you're missing a couple of who, what, where, when, why, how, right? There's a couple I'm missing here, but that would be six good questions about prayer, and that's, I wrote four, so I'm not gonna include the other two. But why, who, and how, and what are a big deal. And today I wanna cover two of them, because the rest of the series, I'm gonna cover the other two. But, but here's the two I wanna cover. Why do you pray, and who do you pray to? Why do you pray, and who do you pray, who do you pray to? And I think if you don't get these two questions asked up front, you really can't get to them. How you pray really does not matter, and what you pray for does not matter if you don't understand why you're doing it in the first place and who you're asking. 
So what I want to do is this series is actually going to be in the book of Psalms. The Psalms, I'm going to talk about this a little bit next week, so I hope you come back so I won't talk, talk a little bit about the Psalms today. <clears throat> but I will say is that the Psalms are one of the most beloved books in the world, Christian or not, Jewish or not, Bible reader or not, churchgoer or not. The Psalms have inspired people for a couple millennia now, and it's because they are so revealing and so honest, and it's a book of prayer. It's essentially people who are asking, pleading, gratifying, or being grateful to, praising God. And it was kind of meant to be somewhat private, and then they got published. And maybe they were. Maybe some of them were meant to be published and meant to, for the world to be inspired by them. But it's a revealing book because there are so many of them, and you can read them, and you go, that is how I feel. And this was a king who was in Judea a couple thousand years ago, and he feels the same way that I do. I mean, they're so revealing. But I, but I want to give us kind of a little bit of a theme verse throughout this. And you're going to see this verse, you know, just spoiler alert, three times today. Because I'm going to look at it a different way. And it's from 1 John. Now, John, we believe, was an apostle who followed Jesus. And he was maybe one of those people who, as the disciples followed Jesus around, at one moment they asked, hey, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? The way you do it and the way we do it are not the same. And these were guys who grew up memorizing the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, who probably prayed more so than every meal. They probably spent a lot of time in prayer, and they kind of knew how to pray until Jesus came along, and he showed them a different way. He showed them a different relationship with God, and he kind of you know, kicked the doors open in on a new way of praying for the world. And several times he does this in the New Testament. He prays for his disciples. He prays for, his, he prays for the world in John chapters 14 uh, to 16. And he has this relationship with God that most people did not understand at the time. But retroactively, post-resurrection, meaning Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. He is with them. He is killed upon a cross. He is resurrected. And the changed lives of his, uh, his disciples made them start to write down some of the words that he said. And they got a newfound motivation for life and a newfound relationship with God. And the Apostle John is one of those guys. And he has this confidence. And here's what he says. This is the confidence that we have before him, before God. If we, and this is a bold statement, listen to this statement. If we ask anything, and I'm pretty sure anything means anything. There's not really another word for that. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, which is where I got the name for this series, that he hears us. He hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, again, this is a what, anything and whatever, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Now, if you just stopped here and didn't read anywhere else in Scripture, this would be very, very exciting. Because you say, or you could go to God, and you could say, look, I've read John 5, 1 John 5. And here's essentially what I was told. That we can ask for anything. That God actually hears us. And that whatever we ask for, we have it if we have asked him. I mean, imagine the power of this. Do you think this could change your family? Do you think this could change your personal life? Do you think this could change your community? Do you think this could change our church? I mean, not to put too hyperbolic of a title to this, but this changes the world, doesn't it? If this is true, this could change the world. Let me give you a couple other examples from Jesus himself. So that way we know is this isn't a proof text. We find one place in scripture where it says this and we roll, roll along from it. Here's what he, Jesus says in Matthew 21. He says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. You know, Jesus is talking to his disciples and Jesus knew this would be recorded later on and that the world over would read it centuries and decades and a millennia after he and said these words. He says, whatever you ask for in prayer, if you believe it, you will receive that. He says it also in this way in John chapter 15, not 1 John, but John chapter 15. You know, whatever you ask for, there's that word again, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, here's the problem with what Jesus just said. Have you asked for something and not gotten it? 
Of course you have. This isn't a hard question. My guess is 100% of people have asked for something in prayer and not received it. So how do you believe these words? If Jesus really says, whatever you ask for in my name, and not all of us know how to pray the same way. For some of us, we pray, and we, it maybe sounds like this. Hey, I don't know who's out there. I mean, hopefully it's, it's you, God, and there's this thing that I really need. And if you could rescue me from it, or if you could provide this thing or this person or this want that I have, I would follow you. I would know that you're real, and I'd be yours. That's just what I'm asking. And then you don't get that thing, which makes it hard to come back to Jesus' words. And for some of us, if we're honest, it makes it hard to trust him because we go, this is what you said, and I did that. I asked in your name, and I did not receive whatever I asked. And I asked you, not only anything, but everything, and you didn't do it. So how do we get past this? And that's what I'm hoping to help, for today, help, help with today. So let's ask these questions real quick. Why do you pray? This is the first one. So why do you pray? And this is probably the most basic thing. And what I'm about to put up on the screen is nothing that is super insightful. And it doesn't have to be because we all know it's true. You know, one of the biggest reasons we pray is to ask someone who can accomplish something beyond our own ability. This is the basis for every prayer. Let me put it a different way. If you could do it, you wouldn't ask God. That's it. If you're $200 short and you could go out and make 200 bucks, you wouldn't pray for God. Pray to God to say, hey, can I have 200 bucks this week? I mean, that would be nice. And you could pray for that. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's not really why we pray. We pray because there is something that goes above our pay grade in terms of ability. There's something that usually, unfortunately, prayer is often the last resort and not the first, not for everybody. But part of the reason we get to God is because we've exhausted all of the other ways that we have tried to enact what we need. We've tried to work for it. We've tried to beg for it. We've pleaded for it. We've asked other people to help us. And then finally, we're like, well, I guess I'll turn to the big guy. See if he will give him a shot. You know, the reason we pray is because we think that if there is a God out there and he is all-powerful, as Scripture says, I mean, this would be easy for him. I mean, he spoke words. And the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and time and space and all continuum and physical matter and the laws of entropy and everything else just came into being. He's just like, exist. And it all was there. I mean, if he can do that, surely, surely me sitting in my room... At 10 p.m. at night, asking him for something is a small, trivial matter. I mean, if he can speak and all things come into existence, if he can resurrect his son from the dead, I mean, me asking for something, small potatoes. Why is it always small potatoes right now? Why isn't it big potatoes? I don't know. But it's small potatoes. I mean, this is the reason we ask is that we come to God and we go, look, I've exhausted my ability and the abilities of the people around me, and I've exhausted all possibilities, and I am coming to you, God, Because I'm hoping that you can do something that I cannot. I mean, that's the basis for prayer, right? Again, this is not groundbreaking. But this is helpful for us to acknowledge. Because the reason we pray is that we go, God, you have a power that I do not. You have a purpose that I do not. You have an ability that I do not. And this is so important for us to understand because... If we're coming to him, it means that in some way, shape, or form, we are so desperate and we are so incapable that we're essentially saying to him, hey, God, you can do all things. You can do anything. Will you help me in this? So that's the basis for why you and I pray. It's not always intense desperation, but we often ask for things. And let me ask you a question. This is kind of an interesting one. If you were God, would you grant every prayer? No. No, I wouldn't do that either. Think about it. Some of you, if you got your prayers answered in the way you would, that you originally asked for, you wouldn't be married to the person you're currently married to. A nervous chuckle went through the crowd. (laughs) Yep. 
Because at some point in our life, you know, we might have gone, you know, if you just give me her or you just give me him, I'll never ask for anything else. And it was a good thing that you didn't get him or her, wasn't it? Because you got someone new and better, right? You wouldn't have the kids or the life that you have now. I mean, if God gave us everything we want, your lives would look very different. You might be in a different career path. You might not be here. You may not even be a Christian because you asked for something. Because God's perspective on life is far greater than our own. And the reason he says no is because he sees something better for you. And I can't explain away every prayer because there are some really good prayers that if he would have said yes, it would have been better for you. And throughout this series, I'm going to try to explain that one, but not today. Number two, who are you praying to? This is going to be my whole point today. So if you have tuned out and I've bored you to tears and you are asleep or you're watching online and you just went to go get a Pop-Tart or something like that, this is the time to tune in. Because if I, if I explain nothing else to you today, I want you to, to pay attention on this section. Okay? You ready? Got your attention? All right. So who are you praying to? There are two different ways to pray. There are probably more so than this, but these are the two most serious ways to pray. Again, there are probably more, and if you know more, feel free to message me or something like that. But here are the two that are probably the way that we pray more than anything else in terms of who we are praying to. The first one is this. When we pray to a business partner, we focus on the exchange. If we, I, you, us, anyone watching out there, If we see God as a business partner, you will always focus on the exchange. Let me give you a couple examples, both good and bad. You know, there are times that we go, hey, God, I've already given you a couple of examples. Hey, God, if you just gave me this one thing, this would really help me out. And if you give me this thing, I promise I will not do this other thing. And there's an exchange here. Look, if you just, if you give me this person in this relationship, I promise I will always honor them and always honor you, and I know that you have heard me. It's an exchange. If you will, then I will. There are sometimes also that you ask for something really, really good. I know, because I do a fair amount of hospital visits. I've had a fair amount of family members who have come down with serious illnesses. And sometimes we go, God, you know, if you would just heal them, and if you would just make sure the doctors knew what was wrong, and if you brought them back from the brink of death, God, will you just do that for me? And at that point, it is not about the relationships. It's what you can get from God. And again, I want to emphasize, it's okay to pray for those things. It's actually a good thing. I think you should come to God and ask for his intervention. I think you should pray for healing. I think you should pray for understanding. I even think you can come to God and pray for stuff. But if your primary motivation is getting all of those things, then you treat and I treat and we treat our relationship with God as a business partnership. Because guess what you'll do and I'll do and we'll do every time we come back to him in prayer. It's the next thing that we ask for. And you know, a lot of prayers in the Bible are not about asking God to fulfill their deepest desires. It's far deeper than that. Because if if we come to God and we get, there there are negatives to both sides. If you receive something here from him, it can be a negative because you'll be like, well, dang, he is listening. I'm going to go ask for more stuff. That's what's going to happen, right? You're like, hey, he did give me that person. He did give me that thing. This is great. I got a list. Like, let's do this. Like, I'm praying every single day for things, right? Right? And if you do that, you get what you want, then you treat God kind of like a slot machine or a bank or the grandpa who comes from out of town who brings you something, and you are attached to what God can give you rather than God himself. And it becomes entirely sad because eventually God will say no, and eventually you will become bitter at him. Hey, it worked last time. Like, I even said the exact same words. I got the formula out. I said this. It was this day and time. I was in this place. And last time you said yes, I came back the next day. Crickets, what's going on? We cannot treat and should not treat our relationship with God, at least in our prayer life, as a business partnership. Because the opposite of that is also is what if you never get what you want? What if you pray and pray and pray and pray? And the answer is always no. You're going to continue to pray? 
Do you think he hears you? I mean, imagine, like, this is like hyperbolic in, in nature here, but imagine if we treated any person who we see in front of us in this way. Mom, can I have this? No. Mom, can I have this? No. Mom, can I have this? No. Mom, can I have this? Well, mom doesn't exist anymore. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Or what if we treated them and they gave us stuff all of the time and we just focused on the exchange? We don't actually have a relationship with them beyond a business partnership. And it's a dangerous way for us to pray. So that's the first one. The far superior one, and the one that I believe that Jesus invites us to, and the one that he, more so than anything, when he taught his disciples how to pray, and I'm going to explain this more in this series, but I'll mention it a little bit today, is this one. You know, when we pray to a family member, we focus on the relationship. So there are probably two major ways to pray. You can, you can have your relationship with God as a business partner. Do I get what I want or do I not? Was this a good day in prayer because I think he will give me this or a bad day because he says no? You see, when you pray as a family member, you focus on the relationship, not the exchange. And again, it's, it's hard to like think about this with a God we cannot see. And so that's why helping us understand it in terms of the people we can see is helpful. Like if you used people for the stuff you could get with them, you don't actually have a relationship with them, right? And you know, when Jesus prayed, when, when his disciples asked him how to pray, do you know what Jesus started with? Father. He totally changed what their relationship with God was supposed to look like. They had not prayed this way before. I mean, God was called Father in the Old Testament, but oftentimes there was a reverence and saying Yahweh, or not even saying God's name. But Jesus essentially said, you know, when you come into the presence of God, whether you're walking on a trail, you're at home, and you're praying by yourself and no one's watching, or you're in public praying with other people, start with the relationship first. Start with who you are to God. And Jesus narrowed that gap quite significantly. He didn't say, hey, oh God, that we can't see. Hey, distant, unknowable, faceless, nameless God. He brought the relationship incredibly close. He says, you are to address the God of the universe as your dad, as father. You got to start there. And the interesting thing behind that is that if you pray in that way, you focus on the relationship and you are more likely to be heard. Let me ask you a very simple question. Depends on your family. Are you more likely to get something you want from a complete stranger or for someone who knows and loves you? Hopefully the second one. You know, there are some generous people out there. But you're more likely to be heard, and you're more likely to be seen, and you're more likely to be getting a yes from someone who knows and loves and cares for you, which is why Jesus wanted to make sure that we came to him in prayer as a family member, not as a business partner. And in Jesus' prayer, he says, Father, you know, hallowed be your name. We don't even have an English equivalent word for that that's really good anymore. Most translations have kept hallowed, which is a good thing. Holy be your name. But he starts with the relationship. He does not start with the asking, which is probably what you and I rush into, right? We can't wait to get to the what part. God, I know you got a busy day, but I got a list here. If you could do these by 5, 445, 445, that'd be good. And so, and then in Jesus' name, amen, kind of at the end. We get to the, the meat of our prayer is often, here's what I need. And as you go through the Psalms, there's a bit of that. But almost everywhere in every Psalm, there's Psalms of laments, there's Psalms of judgment and justice. And almost in all, every Psalm, there is this aspect of praise for who God is, whether or not he will give them what he wants. So my encouragement to you as you go home in this week, we're not finished, we're almost there, is it to check what your relationship with God is like when you pray. If you rush into the, here's the asking phase because I have some things that I need, then you may have a business partnership. And I I will say this, I think God honors that for a time. I think he will say yes in order to capture your heart. But I think eventually we can become spoiled children. If we get yeses and yeses and yeses, it's just what we want from him and not him himself. So I want to come back to the scripture we read at the front end. So 1 John said this. This is how we read it. And I would like to change 
how we read this scripture. Because you've noticed I've bolded some words here. Remember, this is how I read it before. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. When you read this scripture like this, here's what we do. And even with the words of Jesus, we focus on the we part. I'm doing the asking. God hears me. And whatever we ask, we get. We have. And we focus on the wrong place. I'm going to put this scripture. You can go to the next one. I'm going to change how you think about this scripture. This is the confidence we have before him, not ourselves. If we ask anything, and we, we kind of gloss over this part. If we ask for something, we get it. That's actually not what it says. It says, if we ask anything according to what? To his will. You see, the promise of God is not that you will get the desires of your heart. The promise of God is that if you desire him, your desires become his desires. And when that happens, he answers every prayer. Because when our desires become God's desires, we know that no power or being on earth can stop the will of God. We can assist We can get in the way, we can fight, but we can't do anything to stop God's promises and God's plan. It's a powerful realization. So you read this scripture differently. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. You see how the emphasis has changed? And this is the change we need to make in our prayer lives. It is not about us in our prayer. This is why books that are entitled, it's not about you and your prayer life, don't sell a million copies. Because we want it to be about us. Honestly, you can go on Amazon. If you search for the books that are the most popular, that have made millions of dollars on prayer, it is self-centered. It is prayers about what we want and what we get. And the books that are written about God's will, let's just say they don't make the top 20,000 on Amazon. Because we want what we want. And we want our will in our way, in our time. And when we come and pray that way, we wonder why our prayers don't get answered. But God's promise, and Jesus' promise, if you go back and read his words, whatever you asked according to his will, you'll get it. And here's the promise. God has promised to answer any prayer that is according to his will and not to yours. So here's what prayer does. It orients your desires and your passions to his. You see, prayer is not getting God on your page. It's you getting on God's page. When you pray, and especially how we're going to pray in this this series is that you're moving closer to God. You're not asking God to move closer to you. And this is why this method is not a popular one. Because we love for God to serve us. We love for God to come to us. We love for God to think about our desires and our will. And we smile if and when he says yes to those things. But it is far harder to move to him, to step closer to him, to put down what we want and to say, God, what do you want in my life? How can I serve and fulfill your desires in my life? And he goes, I'm glad you asked. There's all sorts of scripture about what that looks like. You know, the guarantee of Jesus' words is that when our will aligns with him, God will answer our prayers. And that's maybe what the basis of prayer is. To understand the relationship that we have as a family member, and to orient our will on our time and our effort and our desires and our future based on what he wants, not what we want. So two questions before we leave. What is the will of God? I mean, if that's what he's asking us, hey, if you answer and and pray according to my will, I'll answer your prayer. That would be my first question. Then what is your will? If that is how I get my prayers answered, I want to know your will. What is the will of God? We'll discover that a little bit in this series. And how do I ask according to his will? How do I ask? How do I do that? 
You know, this wouldn't be a prayer series if we didn't end on prayer. What I've done is I've asked some people to come up, and you, can, you guys can start making your way up there, up here. If you're a board of director, a member of the elders, if you're part of our prayer team, if you're part of our staff, or if you're a volunteer here today and you just want to be up here for prayer, I want to invite you up. It wouldn't make sense for us to do a prayer series without mentioning a few different things. You know, during this series, we're going to give you a couple different ways to request prayers. One of them is we're going to hand out some prayer cards, and we want you guys to be able to to have those and to tell us how we can pray for you. Another one is we have a prayer area in the back. There's a private room back there. If you feel like you want to have your prayers heard privately, there's a prayer area as well. And what we wanted to do in this is we wanted to just give you a sample of how many people will be praying for you and your family during this time. So the staff members and the board of directors and the elders and the volunteers and people who are up here are praying for you because there is nothing so powerful as prayer. No message, no music can compare to asking the God who can accomplish beyond our ability. So as we end our time today, I'm going to pray for you, and I want you to see the people who will be praying for you during this series too. So will you join me in prayer? Father, we're thankful that we get to come to you with that first word, that you are our Father. Lord, this week, just help us see our relationship with you as one of a family member. Lord, those who have said yes to your son, Jesus Christ, your scripture has said we have become sons and daughters of you. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Lord, there's so many prayers that are uttered and things that we ask for and help us just this week concentrate on our relationship with you, who we are to you, that we are forgiven, that we are holy. And for those who do not yet believe in you, Lord, I pray that they extend some time in their hands and their heart and their head to discover you are far greater than anything else and help them too see you as a father. And Lord, as we ask things of you this week. I pray that you hear it as pleads of your children, asking their father for good things. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to dismiss these guys right here. Last thing for you uh, to think about and hopefully to do, I think it would be a shame if you were to leave right now and to go directly to your cars. And most people don't know that I think the most important place in our building are the doors. And the reason for that is I hope you come in And you are changed by the music and the message that when you leave, you leave a different person. And so we've got provided a couple different ways to do that. One is the shameless plug for food. Everyone stays for food, so hopefully you do that. There's food out there. Please don't take all the maple donuts. Those are my favorite. Uh, But I think there's one outside. You You can go ahead and do that. There's hot dogs and other stuff out there. And the other thing is, is get in a group. If you are not in a group in our church, don't waste any more time. Join one. There are men's and women's groups. There are events out there. There's a golf tournament coming up. There are small group studies. And then there's a a, a series called He Hears Us. And you'll unfortunately have to hear from me twice a week, uh, once on Sundays and once whenever your group meets. But go outside, join a group, say yes to being in community. Because if you just go home and pray for yourself, that will be effective. But if you are in a small group of people who are praying with you and for you, it's even more effective. You are blessed when you are with people that do that for you. So my final encouragement today, go outside, join a group, get connected here, have some food, don't eat all the maple donuts. Thank you. You are already blessed in Christ. Have a great Sunday. 